Okay, I'm going to go ahead and record and start and start our presentation. It's right at nine o'clock. We have a lot of amazing content to get through, so I'm going to jump right into it. Um, there will be people filtering in as we go, so please, if you could, mute yourself. Um, and if you do get muted by the host, uh, please don't take offense. It's just so that we can hear the recording and make sure that, that everyone um, has a really wonderful experience with this. We'd prefer, just because it's a really big group, that everyone keep their videos either off or, or muted so that we can have um, less distraction for our presenters. So anyway, let's jump into it. My name is Abby Smith. I'm the Savory Global Network Coordinator. I'm also the hub leader for the Jefferson Center, which is the hub ser serving Northern California and Nevada. And we're having a webinar and a conversation today about carbon markets and ecosystem services with three people that I deeply admire, deeply respect, have tremendous information and knowledge and experience to offer us in this conversation. And the reason that we're having it, or the reason I wanted to host this webinar for all of us, or this, really it's basically a virtual conversation for all of us, is that I have these conversations and I get these questions as a hub leader, talking to other producers in our region and in our network. Um, I, I have these conversations at the global level with other hubs internationally, and there's just a lot of things going on in this space with carbon markets, with looking at how we get, we can sequester um, really important molecules like water, like carbon, how we can build organic matter, how we can bring life back to the land. And I think that you'll, this will become apparent when we go through it, but there's, there's, a, there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot that's still being figured out. It's a rapidly evolving space. There's a lot of, at least of the producers that I've worked with, there's a sense of maybe distrust or like, I'm not really sure what that's about. But then there's also the sense of there's excitement and opportunity there. And so there's a lot of emotions and, and all of this together creates just a swirl that can be not very clear. So the, the real intention today is to gain understanding, to gain clarity, and for all of us to take one more step forward in um, using this opportunity to make our world a better place. So that's really what the conversation is about today. Before we jump into it and turn it over to our amazing panelists, there's a few um, housekeeping things I wanted to go over. First, a peek at our agenda. We'll go through some introductions. We'll have discussions. So I have specific questions that have been prepared. Our panelists have prepared responses to those, answer, those questions. And then we will have a time after their presentations to have an, an in-depth conversation. And you may ask your questions of them. As I know for myself that if I don't write the question down when it comes to my mind, I will likely forget it. So what I recommend doing is using the chat window in your Zoom toolbar and just typing the question in there as it arises. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about distracting us, anything like that. And I'll just type a little note in here to, to say hello and let you know where that is. So use the chat window to put your questions and your thoughts and your feedback, whatever you'd like to put in there. Please um, use that for our record. And then we will take time at the end to have the panelists specifically address your questions. So a few housekeeping roles. We're a big group today. I think it will continue. People continue to filter in at least halfway through the presentation. So we're going to keep muted. Um, Q&A, by Q&A, I mean the chat window. Um, do use the chat box. That's confusing. Sorry about that. And then just avoid distractions. So I wanted to introduce you to our panelist. Um, this is just a, a brief bio. I will send out this, this recording and the um, PowerPoint to everyone. So if you wanted to read through this later and learn more about Phyllis and Paul and Marie, then you can do that. So we won't go through that copy now, but a little bit about them. And again, you can read more later. So I wanted to turn it over um, <clears throat> first to Marie. Do you, would you like to Tell us more about yourself. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. It's super exciting to be able to uh, just chat with and connect with so many other producers and farmers and folks that are working in this space. 
Um, I'm Marie Lilia Mullins, and I manage a small goat farm on the north side of uh, Boulder in Colorado. I'm also the program director for Region Future Capital's Soil Regeneration Program, where we aim to help farmers in the transition into regenerative practices from chemical industrial systems with grant funding. So, um, just a little bit more about my background. Um, I have worked in environmental advocacy for years. That's kind of what led me down the road to the nexus of the, the connection between soil health, environmental health, human health, and what led me to agriculture ultimately and led me to farming. Um, I've worked in the past with organizations like NADAG and the National Land Farmers Coalition on um, policy efforts to support farmers and ranchers in the adoption of soil health practices, um, both on the ground with farm planning as well as uh, policy advocacy, which is super fun. Um, well, if there's, a, I think, one more slide, I can kind of really quickly walk you through Region Future Capital's um, theory of change and economic model. Um, on the next slide, yeah, there you go. Um, so our program, we take investments and profits from renewable energy projects, and we use those percent of those profits to invest in regenerative programs. So Region Future Capital is a, a company that's based out of Europe. They work on projects all over the world, uh, and uh, we're leading the effort in the U.S. to um, contribute to the U.S. agricultural industry and being able to implement and support producers in implementing soil health practices with grant capital and access to carbon markets. So that's what we'll be diving into today. Oh, you're there's, muted. There's, there's the mute button. You think I'm never on a mute on a mute, right? <laughs> it's my first one, guys. Um, so our Phyllis um, is up next. And um, Phyllis, would you like to? First, are you, can you hear us? And would you like to tell us more about yourself? We'll go back to Phyllis here. Let's see. Well, I think she's having some connection problems. Marie, is there anything you'd like else you'd like to share while Phyllis gets all set up with us? Uh, Sure. Um, I guess what I'm really excited about to discuss today and excited to have conversations with all of you is, like Abby mentioned, the, the development of this space and um, how new it is for producers to be able to access it. I think it's a really exciting time and opportunity for us to all plug in. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity there and there's a lot of challenges that are around. So it's, it's really exciting to be able to chat and just share and collaborate with everyone on what those challenges are, what the opportunities are, and how we can all work together to uh, create a market that is accessible to producers in the long run. I think um, in, in the hi history of carbon markets, they have traditionally been around uh, the industrial system. So I, I'm a chemical engineer by trade. So when you look at like mass balance of systems, you're looking They've designed the carbon market originally around combustion engines, for example, where you know exactly what's going in and you know exactly what's coming out. Uh, so the challenge that we're facing now and the opportunity that we have is that there's so many complex dynamic things happening in an ecosystem that can't be, can't have a box <laughs> put around them. So that's kind of the opportunity that we have to, to explore um, what the mass balances are in the ecosystem with carbon and water and other uh, minerals and resources um, that could be brought into the marketplace that wasn't traditionally designed for ecosystem and ecology, but was designed for um, you know, heaters and exchangers and combustion engines. So yeah, that is a, a pretty neat space that we're working in. Awesome. Thank you, Marie. That's, that's a great perspective. Phyllis? Do you want to give a quick introduction to yourself? We have your beautiful picture here. And we have your face at real in real time. It's awesome. There I am. Uh, thank you, everyone, first of all, for your patience. I know I was a little late. So I was out harvesting carbon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> actually, um, we're gathering up hay. The weather's been beautiful here in New York. And uh, we're gathering up hay. So um, we farm about 1,200 acres. We own a, 
uh, just shy of 700, we lease another 500. Um, we also milk um, about 275 cows and um, I farm with my family, my husband and our five kids and um, have been involved in with the Savory Institute for a number of years, six, seven years now. Um, uh, I also train um, other producers for, within our milk shed. I ship my milk to Maple Hill Creamery and uh, I do some grazing training and uh, just generally try to help as many producers as I can. Um, I did a little bit of work with Indigo Ag, which is another player in the carbon market. So I got a little bit of a perspective from the, um, the, per, the side that is trying to figure out how we're going to make this uh, carbon sort of work as a crop as a revenue stream, uh, as if you will, and some of the challenges that exist on that side. But for the most part, I'm here as a producer and trying to learn more about how carbon works um, and how it relates to organic matter. Um, what is carbon? How does it move through the system? How do we capture it? Um, Plants seem to be able to make carbon out of thin air in a sense, but on the other hand, we also harvest it and usually move it somewhere else or it becomes part of an animal or an animal product or it becomes a direct food product. So that's uh, my role here today. Thank you. Awesome. Phyllis, thank you so much. And thank you for all the good work you do to harvest and manage that carbon cycle. <laughs> awesome, we have Marie. Paul, it's over to you. Great, thank you. You want to bring up my first slide for me? Yeah, we don't all look at your smiling face. I love it. I love this picture of you. Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> there let's, you are. let's go to the next slide if we could. There you go. There we go. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everybody. It, it, it's also a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I'm Paul Zorner, Chief Agronomist for Locust Agricultural Solutions. Locust is an agricultural products company with a strong focus on microbial soil amendments and and their ability to support soil health and crop productivity, but in doing so also generate environmental benefits such as soil carbon sequestration, uh, reduced need for inorganic fertilizers, and substantially reduced nitrous oxide emissions. And as such, we are also one of the few agricultural input companies in the world to achieve B Corp certification, which is, which is the focus on not only profit, but purpose and people as well. We're very, very proud of that. So if I could have the next slide. Abby, can I have that? There we go, thank you. So I'm a biologist, so of course you're gonna get stuck with a little biology from, from me always. Uh, to provide some context for uh, our focus at Locus as well as today's webinar. And, you know, just like probiotics are beneficial for humans, they are remarkably beneficial for plants. It's pretty easy and I think also accurate to think of soil microbes as soil probiotics as the root zone microbiome or the, you know, the, the, you know, all the soil and everything around the plant roots serves the same function for plants as the gut microbiome does for humans. And we can do wonderful things for, for crops, grassland and pastures if we can enrich and support this you know, very ecologically important microbial community through regenerative practices and the use of microbial amendments. Uh, so the next slide, uh, Abby, if you could. So a, a quick demonstration of this is, is, uh, is this NDVI remote sensing data for the use of our managed turf microbial product called Teradyne. Um, for those of you not familiar with NDVI, it allows you to observe remotely from drones and things like that, to observe plant stress, chlorophyll density, and all kinds of important aspects of plant health. And red and orange are bad, yellow is better, and, and green is great. On the left-hand side, you can see November 7th, this field, and this is the managed turf field. This is as close as I could come to, to pasture and rangeland. I apologize, but I, I thought it was close enough. Uh, and fairly sad shape. And we treated the right and lower two thirds of the field. And you can see 60 days later on the right-hand side, just dramatic improvement, all directly related to improving microbial diversity and density in the root zone. So the final slide for me, okay. if you want to go to that one. Uh, 
Thank you. And this is kind of what, what Phyllis and, and Mary were, were, were getting at. This is my attempt at folding together the big picture. And it's really important we think about the big picture because this all is a, an ecological relationship. I'm actually a systems ecologist by, by training. Uh, and, and it basically allows a basic explanation of why plant productivity and health is, is directly related to soil carbon sequestration. You know, you think about it, plants are remarkable in natural carbon pumps. They, they use atmospheric CO2 to create sugars and use those sugars to build leaves and roots and fruits and all kinds of good stuff, grains. But they also exude about 20 to 30 percent of those sugars into the root zone to, to, to feed purposefully and nurture purposely the microbes that they need to be productive. Uh, as these microbial populations turn over, their bodies accumulate as, as soil carbon. It's called necromass. And it's really all organic matter in soil as a direct result of microbial activity. Um, so if you establish practices that allow more diverse and, and functional root zone microbial populations, those microbes actually have a genomic interaction with the plant and will stimulate much greater root mass, uh, high leaf chlorophyll densities, accelerated foliar productivity and growth, uh, which will all then contribute to even more nutrients being exuded from the now larger root mass to feed an even larger soil uh, microbe population and deposit more soil carbon. It's, it's really, to me, it's a beautiful and very natural ecological relationship we can use to increase productivity and, and harvest the ecological benefits of that. So that's, that's my two cents worth on the biology of what's going on. Thank you, Paul. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we'll jump right into our questions. I love, we have some, some comments and questions already coming in. Get, just a reminder to use that chat window if you want to put your thoughts and questions there and we'll address them at the end. So Phyllis, I have, um, she's up first to tell us the story of the carbon marketplace. So how did it develop? Where are we today and where is it going? And so Phyllis, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that if you would mind sharing with us. Um, I think as a producer, people have been um, wondering about the carbon marketplace for quite some time. I would say um, easily five to 10 years, maybe longer. I think other producers have been talking about the fact that um, carbon along with other ecosystem services ought to be part of the equation. And I think that the reason for that is um, in general, our agricultural industry has been more of a harvest mentality. We've had a lot of technology in the last three quarter century that has enabled us to basically harvest the carbon out of the soil and sell it as a commodity um, and to sort of deplete that savings account, if you will. And there is obviously this movement to help put that back in. But there doesn't exist any compensation within the marketplace for those who are trying to put that back in. There's the intrinsic value of better health in your crops, better yields over time. But in the short term, it's a very difficult thing. So there's this conversation about, you know, can't we build that into the price? And I think as a producer, that's where, it was, where sort of the pull for that um, came from. And as that voice came out, you know, hey, we're putting carbon back into the soil. Isn't there some way we can work this out? The obvious other side was, hey, well, for those of us that have excess carbon going into the atmosphere, maybe we can work together. And that's sort of, to me, where the idea of this carbon marketplace was born out of it. And now we have some very big brains trying to figure out whether we can measure that carbon, how we can measure it, um, how we can make it all sort of a fair game. Um, and I think um, I see in, in the comments, there's already a question about, well, what is a fair price? Um, you know, Jason Roundtree is, is um, putting together numbers that are quite large that say, well, the benefit that we've gotten for every ton of carbon that we've taken out of the soil is a much higher amount than the current numbers that are being thrown around, which are anywhere from 10 to $40 per ton. Um, he's saying that we've gotten more of a benefit than that. So uh, personally, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think that from a producer's perspective, that's where the conversation has been sort of landing. Awesome, thank you, Phyllis. Um, and then Paul, we, we wanted to talk about exactly what the carbon market is. And is it this industrial model that 
that Marie spoke about? Is it something new that could be ecosystem based? Um, can you to help us understand that? Yeah, I, I hope so. Uh, you know, it, it, like, as everybody has said, you know, it, it's developing. And, and but, but what I thought I'd do is go through a little of the, the logic as to why is it developing. And then, you know, we work with Nori ourselves or others like Indigo and, the, you know, the Montana uh, 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 Grasslands Carbon Initiative. There are several things that are, that are going on. So let me start off with say, number one, the world is warming up. Okay, and so there's a collective global desire to hold warming to no more than two degrees centigrade. And to do that, you know, the calculations are that we've had to cut emissions by at least 8 billion tons of, of CO2 equivalents by 2025 and 20 billion tons by 2030. And there, that's a lot of emission reductions. And I, and I think globally, people are realizing that, that that's not going to hit the mark, that we also need methods to, to extract CO2 from the atmosphere, what they call drawdown. And, and agricultural soils are, without doubt, the world's largest carbon sink and our best bet uh, of doing this. And in fact, Raton Lal from Ohio State just won the World Food Prize. He won the Japan Prize as well last year for his work in this area. He estimates that we've lost about 135 billion tons of CO2 of, of carbon from, from agricultural soils globally. And, and you know, some people say, well, you could never put enough into the soil to make a difference. Well, it, it appears as though if all you did was replace that 135 billion tons, that's equivalent to 65 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, you know, from 415. That's, that's remarkable. So a remarkably scalable system. <clears throat> so multiple countries through regulatory caveats and large businesses just from you know, shareholder demand and, and, a, and a variety of things. And, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, Delta, have all literally publicly committed billions of dollars to, to reduce or offset their emissions to become carbon neutral. So this has stimulated, you know, both regulatory and voluntary markets developing to provide credits that can be purchased. Uh, and as Phyllis was saying, anywhere from 10 to $40, we work with Nori right now, and you can go to nori.com if you're not familiar with it, nori.com. And they're, they're a great uh, organization. It's a carbon marketplace, uh, which brings active buyers, like the ones I've just mentioned, together with verified sequestered carbon sellers. Uh, and, and Nori is interesting. They work with Comet Farm, which is a Colorado State uh, USDA NRCS predictive model that uses metadata and records to quantify soil carbon sequestration and that is amplified over and above by management practices like regenerative practices over and above quote unquote standard practice. Because there's a, there's a concept called additionality here that they, they want to reward people for doing things they wouldn't otherwise normally be doing. And so there's the additionality part of that. Um, and with Nori, it's, you, know, you collect this data and then you turn it over to a third party verification agency. It's about $3,000 to $5,000 to register and verify, verify a farm. And it doesn't have to be a contiguous farm. It could be even a few farms going together to do this and maybe it'd be $8,000 if they had a lot of them. And, and right now in the Nori marketplace, it's about 10 to $15 per ton, paid, but interestingly paid retroactively last five years. Uh, so we're signing some of our growers up right now, and, and, and it's a pretty big check if you've got, you know, uh, 1,000, 5,000, 5,000, 5,000 acres. And it's a 10-year contract uh, with Nori. And there are other markets as well, as I mentioned, uh, Montana Grassland Initiative, Indigo has a cropland-based carbon program. And the new farm bill has several incentives to place, uh, it, or I should say in place, to encourage practices which would build soil health. Uh, the whole point being that agricultural rangeland and pastureland have remarkable potential to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and deposit in soil where it can not only you know, be stored and will add to the productivity of that soil, but will create you know, uh, 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 new financial incentives and a, and a new income stream for, for ranchers and growers that is, that is desperately needed in these times, but also serves society in, in very beneficial ways as well. Awesome, Paul, thank you. Um, Marie, I wanted to ask you the next question. 
about the roles in the marketplace? What are, who are the players? What are the, in this, in this place? What do we yeah. show up? So, yeah, really great question. And there's a few sub questions that we've talked about that um, I kind of want to pull some of what Paul was talking about around, uh, you know, the, the development of the marketplace. And I, I see these two things, right? We, um, what, it, what is working in the current marketplace? And that is, in my mind, that it's creating this, uh, this really increased interest in bringing a lot more people together to talk about soil health practices. I think that's a really amazing thing that has come about in, in this whole communication and, and conversation around carbon markets for producers. Um, these practices increase resilience. So like Paul mentioned, the climate is changing. And I've noticed on, you know, in the last three years that I've spent on the farm where I am now, how different every single year is and how it's impacted differently based on the year, like the, the weather, the precipitation, the climate, and of course you are all familiar with that. So there's, a, there's these two pieces where there's this changing climate and implementing these soil health practices increases our resilience as producers. And it's also sequestering carbon to mitigate, the, to mitigate the problem in the first place. So there's this really amazing opportunity for all of us to have roles in this, this place. But one thing I think that is really important to, to, to kind of just have a, around the conversation is that the carbon market, like we've mentioned a few times, is, is developing for producers. Um, there's multiple roles that, that we'll kind of talk about. Um, where are the gaps currently? Where, how do farmers and ranchers participate? And uh, what, are, what is expected of the producers to engage in this? But I think what's really important to, to acknowledge is that, um, and why I'm so excited about this work with the carbon marketplace and just looking at how we change our practices to sequester carbon and all of the other benefits that are embedded in that, that go above and far beyond whatever happens with this carbon market that is developing. Right, and I think that that's just something on on the I don't know on the edges of this that's really important to to think about. And I hope and what I see is that the carbon market is creating more attention around these practices. And then when producers are brought into it, that maybe are are changing their practices or implementing new things, they're seeing these abundance of benefits that are happening on the land that go far beyond. Uh, carbon markets. Um, so it, I just felt like that was important to kind of highlight. Uh, the market is in development. So um, Paul mentioned a few times Nori, RFC, Regen Future Capital is also working really closely with Nori in their development. Um, there's a lot of development around uh, these various models that Comet is using to project to predict carbon outcomes. Uh, well, I think we're going to talk a little bit later about like where the producers are located and how they plug in and why there's like so much focus on the Midwest croplands right now, for example. Um, but there, so there's a lot of things that still need development in this marketplace. The, the models, we need more data, we need more understanding, we need a industry agreement on measuring soil carbon. That's like this big high level question that's like, okay, I have all of this data, I've been collecting this data, I can show that with this methodology that soil is being sequestered or carbon is being sequestered in the soil, but someone else doesn't agree with that methodology. So that's kind of one of those gaps that needs to be developed right now within the industry is that uh, there, we need to come to an agreement on how we actually measure soil carbon. And that's um, something that's in development right now. Um, and then also user friendly data interfaces. So one of the biggest challenges right now in entering the Norian marketplace for a producer is that it is tedious. It requires a lot of data. And I think we're gonna dive into data a little bit more here in a minute. Um, but there's, uh, you know, <laughs> the kind of the next question that we're talking about is where do the farmers and producers fit in? And in my mind, that should be stewarding the land. And we want, we want the farmers and producers to be on the ground, it gives me goosebumps. I'm getting had goosebumps. <laughs> it's just like we want the producers to be on the land, but right now to enter the carbon marketplace, it requires them to be behind their computer. That's a challenge. That's something that we need to address as an industry and as uh, as a community. That um, you know, that's kind of what we our RFC or Regional Future Capital has been working on is how do we make this accessible for producers? That helps us scale our program and helps more producers access that marketplace. So 
Uh, we need better models. We need a industry agreement around measuring soil carbon, and we need more user-friendly access to uh, for producers to get to actually have their data uploaded into the the marketplace to to verify and monetize that that information. So I see farmers and ranchers per, uh, participating. And as this marketplace and this industry develops around it, and there's more and more opportunities for uh, support organizations to help with the data management and onboarding into the marketplace, that uh, I think the biggest role farmers and ranchers have in this market is to keep doing the good work that they're doing, tra uh, keep track of the data as well as you can, because on the, on the other side, the better your data is managed and, and organized, the easier it's going to be for you to enter the marketplace. Um, and that's, that both I think are like the two biggest, you know, opportunities are uh, keep, you know, innovating and doing those, the good things on the land with increasing soil health practices and measuring the changes in soil health and looking at biodiversity and looking at water and all of those things are coming down the line in this marketplace. So if we keep track of them now, we'll have an abundance of opportunities um, and we're getting all the other benefits, right? No matter what happens with this carbon marketplace. All of these other benefits are coming along with it, and there's going to be opportunities to, to plug into, I, I hope, various value-added marketplaces, uh, increased yields and abundance on your land, and increased stocking rates, and all of these other things that come along with focusing on soil carbon. Mary, I just, I not, don't want to jump in on your time, but I second 100% because um, well, two things. At the very least, this early development of carbon, you know, we're going to take what we can get as producers for um, compensation. And I think that that's, that might be just what we need to get the momentum moving so that we can reap those longer term benefits. And as an organic producer, certified organic producer, it was very tedious for the record keeping that was involved in that. But it makes you a better producer. You... Um, the, the better you are at observation and making correlations, the better you can make your advancements. So this really shouldn't be viewed as, you know, um, gathering data and collecting all of this information just so that I can get the paycheck. It really is actually going to make you observe and look at things that have to do with one another. And it's really going to boost your ability to manage your, your farm as well. So I just wanted to put another plug for your perspective because I think it's great. <laughs> Awesome, thank, Phyllis, thank you so much from that producer's perspective. Um, Marie, is there more that you'd like to add or should we jump into our conversation about data? I think she's frozen. I'm just really quick, I was just going to, um, you know, echo what Phyllis just said and that, I, I, I hope that this is, I hope that this is the icing on the cake, that accessing these carbon markets is the icing on the cake and focusing and, and on these practices that can help you enter that carbon market are going to bring you a myriad of other benefits and that's that's really what I hope for. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, all right. I just wanted to can everyone hear all right? I just want to make sure my connection is still stable. Is it good? Yeah, I hear you just fine. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. Um, so data, I think this is such an important piece and we've already gotten to this. We're only, you know, a half an hour into our conversation. We've already hit data many times. Um, I, I think um, as a producer and as someone who works with producers, um, data is, is so important as we've, we've mentioned. Um, it also, I feel like can be taken from the farmer and there's some, there's ones, people who have been Part of programs that had big promises before they and they've been burned by people taking their data and using it to their advantage and not putting the farmer first and so i feel like for us for me as a hub leader and someone that's part of the savory network it's so important that whatever we do we put the farmer first and that they're they're being uplifted by the program and whatever is being transacted in the marketplace and um, and so we i think it's important now that we when we have that conversation about data it's in that in that vein and um, anyway, we'll jump into that. But uh, Paul, we wanted to ask you how, how data is collected now in an in efficient, economic and meaningful way. And maybe we haven't gotten there yet based on what I've, I've heard so far, but. 
Well, yeah, I could certainly make a few comments. Uh, the first thing I want to do, though, is 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 kind of support what Phyllis and, and Mary were saying with respect to the productivity, even if the carbon markets didn't develop, but they will. This is all about productivity and resilience of the land. I mean, it's, it's really important to keep that in mind. And as I tried, the point I was trying to make in my one slide before was that if you get the productivity, you're going to get the carbon sequestration. They're naturally linked to each other. They're two sides of the same coin. So, but back to carbon sampling. And I always joke with people that if you ask 10 people about how carbon sampling would best be done, you're going to get 11 opinions. Uh, but that's really not fair. Uh, you know, I was talking to Keith Heidecorn, our, our VP of Sustainability this morning, and he knows a lot more about this than I do. And, and you know, he has a member of sev several groups, uh, the Gold Standard, Vera, uh, but he said one of his favorite ones, not that any of them aren't his favorite, but is a group called Open Teams Group, which is run by the Wolfneck, Wolfneck Ag Research Center, which is a, a, a far uh, supported group that is an open source for people to contribute to, okay, what is the best way of doing the carbon sampling? And we're just going to talk about carbon a little bit, and I'll talk about nitrous oxide maybe just later on. Uh, but there's still, there's no general consensus. And certainly the key here is you, you can't be kind of trying to generate $50 to $100, let's say just to use round numbers of carbon credits and spend $150, you know, to collect them. And, and your point on the data is the grower's data. I mean, the, the, and that needs to be safeguarded. Uh, but there are all kinds of, of different ways in which people might do this. Right now, you know, people are, are looking about taking soil sampling down to, to, to 30 centimeters, which is about a foot. They'd like to go down to a meter, but it becomes more expensive. And they've kind of settled on something called zone sampling. And that's like one sample per 10 acres, one sample per five acres, one sample per 20 acres. But that kind of depends upon the soil heterogene heterogeneity. In, in terms of, you know, if you've got uniform soil types, maybe you could go one sample every 20 acres or so. Uh, and so you do carbon sampling through, through dry combustion and you do bulk density, which is like the texture, the soil aggregates, things like that. And most of this is driven by the, by the carbon, maybe 5% by bulk density. And if you go to Ward Labs in Nebraska, the, you know, they'll give you one soil and one bulk density sample for 15 bucks. Uh, so if you're going to do it every 10 acres, well, that's $1.50 per acre, uh, which is bad. But again, I think people have to kind of agree on, well, what, what is the frequency by, by which this is going to be, be done and how deep uh, and, and, you know, a, a variety of things along those lines. But people are working towards remote sensing of this as well. Uh, 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 people are working with drones to, to try to take a look and see if you can't use methods that would actually allow you to determine soil content based upon LIDAR or other types of mechanisms. You know, nitrous oxide is very important in this whole equation as well. Nitrous oxide is 300 times the global warming gas uh, that CO2 is. And in this case, you're not trying to store carbon. In this case, you're trying to prevent emissions of nitrous oxide from fertilizer applications. Uh, and we're involved in an ARPA-E project right now, or a proposal, where they're, they're wanting to develop methods for, for accurately measuring nitrous oxide, because right now it's an $85,000 portable FTIR device. You need a PhD just to run it. It's impossible. <laughs> and so groups are, are being challenged by ARPA-E to come up with drone-based systems that will cost us, you know, uh, again, dollars per acre to detect. And sure enough, there's technology out there to do that. So I'm very hopeful uh, but we, we have got to get to the point where it's, it's easy to collect. And then as, as both Mary and Phyllis probably are going to talk about or have talked about is that we, we need the data analysis. Uh, I'm doing some work with a grower called uh, Rory Palman in, in, in Western Nebraska. And he's got the University of Nebraska and IBM and other people involved to use machine learning to, to take a look at all this data and try to get the data itself to tell you what's going on. So, Perhaps I've just clouded the whole thing. There are methods, there are groups. You know, if you want to think about soil carbon sampling, if you want to use zone sampling, you know, maybe you figure a dollar fifty to maybe three bucks an acre, uh, and 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 we go from there. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. I know it's not an easy one to to answer. Um, and Phyllis, in the current space, or the question really is how how are producers' rights protected and producers' data protected? And feel free to expand on that and how, if 
that isn't we aren't there yet as a marketplace how they should be protected or what you think would be the ideal um i can't speak uh, in broad generalities i know at least at indigo um the data belongs to the producer it's the the way the agreement sort of fleshes out um indigo says we're going to use the data in a in a in a way that is uh, anonymous to the producer and the producer themselves actually own the data so the data goes with the producer um, once the contract is finished you know that data stays with the producer it doesn't go anywhere um, except there but um, it's used by indigo which for obvious reasons it has to be in order to actually analyze and utilize the data and, and aggregate it they need um, obviously to, to have it but the um, the rights to the data stay with the producer and I think that that's very important and I don't see why that really should be a problem I don't see how that would impede anything um, why somebody would need to own it other than the producer great yeah that, that's awesome to hear and then Marie, anything else you want to add on data? What what data would be needed? Um, what isn't? Anything else you want to add on the data piece? Yeah, um, I guess one quick thing to add to Phyllis's chat around data rights um, and protections. Uh, Nori is really similar, and um, that's the marketplace that I've been interacting with most frequently. And and just in general, I think the producer should always maintain ownership of the data. We all have to be very careful and mindful when we're reading these contracts before we sign them that no one is purchasing our data because what that can lead to is someone purchasing it for $10 a ton, what it could earn you, and the marketplace selling it for $100 a ton in five years as it develops. So I think it's just really important to, to understand the risks that are involved in transference of data and really read thoroughly the contracts that you're signing around carbon markets and um, in any usage of your data in general. Um, as far as what data is needed to enter the carbon marketplace, so uh, my understanding that Nori is the, is the active marketplace of the, of the industry right now. There are a lot of other ones that are in development that are coming down the line, but Nori is, is active, farmers can start plugging into it right now. And there's a lot of data that's required and this is the, the bottleneck that we're finding in the marketplace that's available right now is this data collection and historical data collection piece. So producers need to be able to access all of their historical management data. Um, so looking at yields, planting dates, harvest dates, any liming, any uh, residue removal, any grazing practices and dates of different fields, um, any chemical inputs, whether that's, uh, or any, any inputs at all. So whether that's chemical inputs or it's uh, manure and organic inputs. Um, there's a, a long list of data requirements that are necessary to access the current market that is Nori right now and their modeling software. Um, they don't require soil sampling right now, but that's also something that other marketplaces may require. So a lot of other marketplaces in the way that they're developing their methodologies are a combination of a model of carbon using Comet, for example, and then also a soil test. And some of them will combine those things to give an actual carbon number. It's kind of how some of them, like the Climate Action Reserve and in Indigo are developing their methodology around carbon, soil carbon. Um, so there, there's a lot of data required and, it, you, it, and it's required historically and moving forward. So you can uh, find really specific lists on the Nori marketplace um, and other areas so that you know if you want to plug into it later what uh, what you need to start collecting right now if you haven't been doing that in the past. Awesome. Thank you, Marie. All right, on to this topic, crops versus pastures versus rangelands. And I want to move quickly through this so that we can have time for our Q&A at the end. Um, so, but Paul, I wanted to start with you and our, our in your work and your from your vantage point, is the ranching community being engaged in the carbon market? Yeah, you know, and I, I actually called one of our cooperators, Jim Strickland in Florida, to ask him this question. And he would he would classify himself as ranch land management. But you know, I then called Mary and you and said, Well, how do, what's the difference between a pasture and a, and a rangeland? <laughs> and I think it's a matter of management intensity, right? Precipitation, a whole variety of things. But 
you know, Jim Strickland is, is Blackbeard's Ranch Beef in, in Florida, and they won the Environmental Stewardship Award from the National Cattlemen's Association. Very knowledgeable guy, but what he told me is, I don't understand. <laughs> you know, I'd like to be involved, but it kind of gets at what Mary and Phyllis were just talking about, uh, which is there's a lot of data, um, and as, and as simple as a program like Nori is, it's, it's really not that simple. There's a lot of data involved, and you know, people have to sit at a computer, they have to have good records, and you know, in terms of, of, of rangeland, it's your management practices, your stocking rate, your grazing method, your forage options, you know, your irrigation, nutritional management, whether you burn or not, uh, erosion control. So as Mary was saying, boy, you better have your data together. And what we're doing as LOPIS is to sit down with people and offering that as a service. Now we're training our staff to sit down with the growers and, and get into their data and help them fill these forms out and do this. But I you know, they are being involved to answer your question. I realize we want to move forward pretty quickly here, but boy, we need some clarification. And I think growers need some help and or ranchers also need some help because their time is best spent out in the field and managing their operations, not sitting at a computer at one in the morning, trying to figure out how to fill out all these forms. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's a, that's a real need. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. And then Marie, do you feel like it's that the carbon market or there's a, a emphasis on cropping or like the Midwest. Can you unpack that a little bit more for us? Yeah, definitely. So I guess uh, right now, one of our challenges in our program development is how to engage ranchers. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one of them being that there is this focus on croplands in the Midwest. And the reason for that is because in, in my experience and understanding is that the, Nori is the active marketplace that's launching right now. And the Dacent model that is the back end of Comet has a lot more data uncertainty in the Midwest croplands, for example, versus data in rangeland California. So I think that's one of the primary reasons that they're focusing on the Midwest right now is because when they, per, when they perform their models, they have a lower percent of uncertainty because there is more data there to back up their models. So that's where, and, you know, earlier when we talked about what needs to be developed is that there needs to be uh, more data collected around the country and around the world in order to have more accurate models if that's the way that the marketplace is going to continue to uh, move forward. Really quickly, one of the reasons I also see that uh, that producers or ranchers aren't being plugged into this as readily um, as cropland farmers right now um, is that big question around how we measure soil carbon and how we're actually monetizing these ecosystem services. If you have a 10-year drought in California, but you've in increased stocking rates by 65% through implementing holistic plan grazing, you're doing good things. Like you're obviously growing more stuff. There's obviously an abundance happening. You're increasing your stocking rates. There's more, there's a larger carrying capacity, but there's no measure in soil carbon with, current, with certain methodologies. There's no measure in the change in soil carbon with certain methodologies because water has a lot to do with how we measure soil carbon and the increase in soil carbon. So that's one of the challenges that we're facing as an industry. And I think we're going to get into ecosystem services and other benefits later that ranchers can point into. Awesome. Thank you. And then Phyllis, about pasture land, what are your thoughts on pasture land or, any, or anything on this topic of these different ag types? Um, as Paul eloquent, you know, very clearly and eloquently pointed out, um, soil microbiology, and Mary just added to soil microbiology, water, and carbon all happen together. If you think about what's happening in the cropland in the Midwest, first of all, it's very easy. It's very um, mathematical. We've reduced crop production to very specific um, protocols, and therefore, to Mary's point, it's very easy to measure. When you get into pastures, you're talking about perennial pastures, usually rangelands have drier periods. Pastures are um, long-term, diverse, lots of water, lots of things going on, but really mushy as far as watching those large trends. So again, hard to, range, hard to measure. Rangelands, a lot of potential because of the area, but um, very, small incremental changes year after year with some stark examples. So I think that, um, you know, if, you, if you're at all a, a member of the agricultural community and you can see how that microbiology has very different, very clear roles in crop production, very sort of massive 
but long-term hard to measure in pasture and you know a smaller wavelength but with a bigger potential in rangeland that's really um, a very easy way to see why the market is reacting the way it is to try to capture that big easy nut first in the crops um, and then the data and these other benefits are going to come along later with pastures and rangelands. Problem my, my prediction is pasture will come first and rangeland will be the last. Um, but there is certainly tremendous potential in that vastness of pastures and rangelands. Awesome. There's, there's a lot of people talking about it right now, too. Just wanted to add, like, all, working on the development of all these marketplaces, everyone is talking about how do we manage grazing lands mm. in this marketplace. So and that's a, that's a, a perfect, of, yeah, sorry, a perfect segue into, and you're actually leading, Marie, so that's perfect, but um, maybe on rangelands there's another market or a better opportunity. Maybe, is there, is it water, is it biodiversity and ecosystem services? Do you want to unpack that more for us, Marie? Yeah, I'll try to do that really quick, and that's <laughs> one thing we talked about in preparing for this webinar is that like every one of these questions could be its entirely its own workshop. <laughs> um, uh, but so yes, right now, maybe the soil carbon market is, is having, is being challenged around rangeland because of measuring soil carbon and how wa much water impacts that and um, the, the, just the, the climate and the environment and the soil types that exist in those areas. But there are other marketplaces that are emerging alongside of the soil carbon market to plug into that create a really great opportunity for um, for ranchers. Uh, a lot of the marketplaces that are being developed are looking at how do we also have these other, if there's, oh man, like, there's so many tendrils that you could go down with this, but um, there's water quality markets that are developed, developing, there's water quantity markets developing, there are like plugins to the current soil carbon market, and, um, like modular settings where you can like, okay, I also want to measure biodiversity, that makes my my carbon token worth more money. Uh, how do we look at habitat creation and biodiversity? So all of those things are coming down the line. I think that'd be a great workshop to dive into. <laughs> um, you could have a whole other workshop on ecosystem services as a whole. But those things are coming, but they're a little bit further behind than where we are currently in the carbon market, though, so I'd say. Well, Mary, not to um, not to jump in on other people's time, but you've mentioned a lot of good ones. But phosphate management and nitrogen management are also yeah, very big so, topic yeah. these days. And there are methods by which you you a you're either regulated, you know, for phosphate and nitrogen, but also mechanisms by which you can be paid for you know, certainly managing phosphate in Florida. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and there's a lot of regional markets that with water and mineral management um, and nutrient management that are around as well. Great point. Awesome. Um, and Phyllis, does does the how does it how does this carbon market compare to past programs or other programs that are not really a marketplace but could create the same outcomes? Um, so if a producer was, I guess, evaluating where they could get involved, what's the highest ROI in their time and effort? What are your thoughts? What would you say? To them? I think that. Um, there are plenty of synergies in the carbon market with other programs. So um, if you were going to go to your local NRCS office and start to look at grants um, for some, you know, some conservation practices, um, you know, you can't be paid from two different markets for the same carbon sequestration, but you can enroll in other problems. There's a lot of synergy. So um, I think that uh, it's, it's becoming easier and easier. I don't think it's really as daunting as people think that it is. Um, it, it, it does require a lot of data, but it's, it's really nothing that isn't too difficult to, to delve into, and it's pretty synergistic. Um, and it would augment uh, some other verifications. I mean, EOV, the e Ecological Outcome Verification and the Land to Market that Savory is doing, any direct market that a producer is doing, if you had the data for even if it was just carbon, but you could talk about water, you could talk about nitrogen, you could talk about all of these other benefits that come along with carbon and carbon market data collection, whether or not you can directly access the carbon market right now, all of these things are going to augment your ability to speak to your production help in this, you know, big problem that we have. So um, it's really very synergistic and I think it will only help 
in whatever other way you're trying to sort of shout out your your exceptionality with these regenerative practices. Awesome. Oh, thank you so much. And we have five minutes. I wanted to have 15 for our Q&A, but we have just five minutes. Um, so we'll make it good. One thing I wanted to mention is that we, we want to do follow-up workshops where, like Marie said, we can dive deeper into that. And so I have two poll questions I want to launch as we go through the Q&A. So everyone should be able to take them. First, we'd like to know more about you as a producer. And then second, we want, we want to see um, what you would like to follow up on. Um, if you, you know, the question. So let's take uh, like two minutes to do this first poll and then I'll launch the other one. But while we're doing that, um, there are some great questions that came in and I want to just turn it over the, to the panelists to look at the chat and see ones that stuck in your mind that you wanted to answer. Um, I personally really liked the one that Mimi put in there that about um, how do we articulate the value of the of the rangelands as we as Phyllis said they're at the back of the line in terms of our ability to quantify their ability but we just somehow we just inherently know man there's there's tons of potential for carbon sequestration and biodiversity and ecosystem health in rangelands um, so how do we communicate their value um, in, in compared to monocrop agriculture that's one question um, any thoughts on that, panelists? Yeah, this is this is Paul. Just real quick, you know, I was going to mention. I, I, you know, preparing for this, I found an, an article by Megan Mockmiller from the University of Georgia and some colleagues from the University of Florida, where they had converted uh, degraded peanut lands to intensively managed gra grazing mm -hmm. over a, over a three year period, and they they measured eight metric tons of carbon sequestered per year as well as a 95% a increase in cation exchange capacity, a 35% increase in, in soil moisture capacity in those soils. So maybe that's a, a partial answer is, I think there's work out there. We, we need to maybe just get out there and show that look, <laughs> grazing and pasture lands and, and range lands are remarkable resources to, to, to do this. And if you think about it, you know, there's 400 million acres of cropland in the US, there's pasture and range land. So if yeah. we're going to do something, we have got to engage the pasture and rangeland community. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that, um, Paul. That it is the, you know, the largest swath of land that's being managed in the U.S. is uh, being stewarded by ranchers, and it's really, really critical to um, to engage that, this community. And I think one of Mimi's questions, I don't know if this is the separate, a uh, different one or the same one, but like, how are we looking at grasslands versus monocultures? Monocultures are annual. Grasslands are perennial, and that just that alone makes such a huge difference in carbon sequestration and and uh, prevention of erosion and water carrying capacity and all of these other things. It's just that if you look at the soils in Iowa, they're going to have a higher percent organic matter because that's the soils in Iowa versus the soils in Northern California. So it's just it's it's a challenging conversation when you just look at it's like statistics and why they're confusing and why they're misleading sometimes is like oh well in Iowa they have much higher organic matter well that doesn't really tell you anything about how much carbon is actually being sequestered on an annual basis that just means that Iowa started with higher organic matter because they're in Iowa so uh it's kind of the challenge of the the conversation as a, <laughs> as a producer just start doing stuff start going out and taking a soil sample even if it's just a basic one that you can afford take one say well i can only do it on this piece over here take the samples send them in count um, plant species do a penetrometer borrow a penetrometer a certain time during the year just we need people out there on their own to just start collecting data it doesn't know it doesn't matter what it is um, it'll probably be relevant. So that's what I would say. And it is probably the fastest way is sort of a grassroots thing. Like if you're out there and you have a piece of land or you know somebody that does has some range land, start talking about it in any way that you can. And that will only augment the data. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Abby, I don't know if you had another question that you wanted to address, but there was one that um, wrote, uh, someone posted, let's see on how does the carbon market differ from the voluntary carbon offset market? I think great, yes. I saw that one, great. About. Yeah, great, please. Yeah. Um, so I guess right now, the carbon market is the voluntary carbon offset market. They're part of the same. So, uh, you know, in other countries, like in Australia, there is more of a 
there is a um, regulatory market around it, but in the United States and largely popularized around the world is a voluntary marketplace. And that's the one that the soil carbon market is plugging into. So right now they're, they're the same, the carbon market could and hopefully will become more regulatory so that we have more opportunities to plug into it and there's more resources being allocated because emitters have to put money into the development of this marketplace. Um, right now it is, it is all voluntary, so it's, it's largely on, on the, all of us to kind of push it and demand it and figure it out. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. We are at the top of the, our hour, so I want to wrap up um, just here with our follow-up. I want, wanted to put this on the screen. This is all of our contact information. Please feel free to reach out to us. Everyone will get a recording, this recording of it, um, and this poll is super helpful. So if you're still on and you see the poll, um, please answer. It looks like about 30 people have voted, which is awesome. We have 57%, so that's great. Um, looks like there's a lot of interest in carbon economics in the carbon marketplace. That's the majority at the moment, but it's shifting as everyone's answering. So um, we will be in touch through, again, with, with the recording and with, with follow-up opportunities. Um, and I know this is just the beginning of the conversation and there's a lot of questions, a lot of comments in there that indicate we can go so much deeper on each of these topics that we just covered from a high level. So let's keep talking about this. Let's stay in touch. And I, I wanna say a deep, deep thank you to Paul and Marie and to Phyllis for taking your time to be with us, to prepare so well, and to offer all that you have to all of us. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate Thanks, you. Abby, for organizing. It was really great. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, well, have a great rest of your day. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.